Hey, welcome to all of you joining us from LinkedIn, YouTube, La Vanguardia. Uh, this live streaming session will be available as a recording later. Uh, my name is Connor Neal. I'm a professor at the SA Business School. I'm the president of Vistage in Spain. And today, you, me, and I think 3 billion people on this planet are in our homes. Uh, today, I'm not speaking to you from the classrooms of ESA up on the hill of, of Pedralbes. I'm speaking to you from my home. And there's 3 billion humans all in their home, all dealing with this time where we, we have coronavirus out in the street. This webinar, how to lead in times of great uncertainty. And now is a time of great uncertainty. Over the last three weeks in my role with ESA and with Vistage, I've spoken to many CEOs. I've spoken to many leaders that are considering EREs and ERTEs, the, the way of reducing uh, your workforce in, in the hotels and restaurants. And it's been a lot of thinking, how do you stay sane as a leader? How do you take good decisions when you're being pushed to take quick decisions? In many cases, you're taking decisions to, to reduce and destroy things that you feel that for many years you've been building. And today I wanted to share with you some ideas and some inspiration just that I've received over my life. To begin, uh, this isn't the first time that humans have faced a crisis. Uh, we've been through pandemics, but it's the first time that, that I've ever lived a situation like this. And I think none of us have clear what the right answers are. Uh, and all of us need to work together to find our way through this. The other thing that strikes me is this disease, coronavirus, the agent of the disease is not a mosquito. It's not a rat. The agent of this disease is a human being. And each of us have a role in choosing whether we are on the side of the disease or on the side of humanity. And in many cases, for you who are watching this, people of action, people who like to roll up your sleeves and get out there and solve things, the way that we choose to be an agent of humanity is not by going out into the world, it's by sitting still. Uh, and for me, that's a big challenge. Sitting still can often be a bigger burden than going out and being active. But for 3 billion people around the world, that's what we're being asked to do act as an agent of humanity. Now, back in 2008, I was an entrepreneur running a business. And in 2008, there was another crisis. And this wasn't an illness. This was the financial markets crashing. And in 2008, uh, coming towards September, I was running a business and Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. And I remember September, October, November, really was a struggle for me. And in November 2008, Ken Blanchard, the author of The One Minute Manager, came to Barcelona. And I remember that he had a lunch where 20 entrepreneurs joined him for a lunch. And he, he spoke about how to lead in times of crisis. And I remember his words being clear. But during the conversation after the lunch, I had the opportunity to speak directly to Ken Blanchard. And I said to Ken, you know, Ken, and at that time, Ken was 82 years old. He walked with a cane. I said to Ken, Ken, that was a wonderful speech, uh, which is what you should say to any speaker after they finished a speech. And I said, Ken, what you talked about, staying hopeful, staying positive, being a voice of gratitude, 29 days every month, I find it within me to be that voice of hope, to be that voice of clarity, to find the energy within me to, to keep pushing the business, the team, our lives forward. But I said, Ken, there's one day every month that I wake up and it's just not in me, the energy to push forward. It's someone else's turn. And I said to Ken, can you manage a business 420 people 
does it ever happen to you that you wake up in the morning and it's just not within you, this energy to be the one that pushes, this energy to be the one that's the voice of gratitude, the light of hope. And I remember Ken laughed to himself. He looked at me and he said, start the day slowly. And he explained to me what this means. And Ken said that every morning when he wakes up, before he engages with technology, before he dives in to all the messages that are coming his way, the news, the, the email, his phone messages, before all of that, he sits on the edge of his bed and he takes a few minutes. And first what he does is takes his hands and places them palms down on his knees and he listens to his mind, he listens to his body. He hears the worries, the concerns going through his mind. He thinks about what he's been through over the night and the day before. He listens to his body. And when he's finished with a few minutes of just hearing the noise that is in his head, hearing the messages that his body has for him, he turns his hands, palms upwards, places them, on his knees and he asks himself, at the end of the day today, what do I want to be grateful for? And he waits until he finds an answer to that question. And back in 2008, when Ken Blanchard shared this message with me that, that when you don't find the energy within, when you wake in the morning and everything feels too difficult, that instead of trying to push yourself harder, the message is to start the day slowly. And I remember back in 2008, I, I thought, that's it. I'm going to do this every single day. I'm going to start every day slowly with a few minutes, just connecting to myself, connecting to what's important, thinking about the day that's ahead and thinking about this question, what do I want to be grateful for at the end of this day? And I fail many days to start with this exercise. Uh, most weeks, I would probably only do one or two days. But I think when I wake in the morning and I really feel empty and tired and lacking the energy to, to go out and be part of the solution, instead of pushing to find energy, I go back and just start the day slowly. And if you don't have the 10 minutes for the full Ken Blanchard thing, my shortcut version is just writing down in my diary in the morning, today is about, and finish the answer. And this idea that uh, you've got as a leader to, to reconnect to what's important, to find the energy so that you can be uh, a voice of positivity for those around you. Now, I don't want this 30 minutes to be a course on leadership. Uh, there's plenty of courses on leadership that you could choose to follow at ESA and other schools over this time in quarantine. What I want it to be is just two or three stories from my life about how I, as a leader in tough times, have found support and energy and to not fall into victimhood, but to stay strong and find a, a way to get through. I think another story that for me is very powerful in these moments of crisis is a story that Jim Collins often shares when he talks about leadership of great businesses. And this story is from 1908. In 1908, there was one point on the Earth's surface that had still not been reached by man. There was the North Pole had been conquered, Everest had been conquered, the Sahara had been crossed. The Nile, the Amazon, people had reached the ends of it. But in 1908, there remained one place that had still not been reached by human beings, the South Pole. And in 1908, Robert Scott from Great Britain and Roald Amundsen from Norway reached the shores of Antarctica on a race to be that final explorer in the great age of exploration to plant their country's flag in the South Pole. And... Robert Scott was more famous. He arrived with all of the resources of the great British Empire. 
And he began his journey 1,600 miles to the South Pole, carrying 250 kilos of all their stores and supplies on sleds behind them as they walked. And Robert Scott, each morning, would open the door of his tent. He would look out. And on a blue sky day, like today here in Barcelona, where the sky was blue, the winds were, were non-existent, conditions were perfect, Robert Scott would walk for 50 miles. There were other days that Robert Scott opened the door of the tent. He looked out and there was gray skies. The wind was blowing against them. They would do 20 miles. And there were other days there in the Antarctic when Robert Scott would open the tent and there were howling gales, hailstones the size of golf balls falling. Robert Scott would close the tent and they would wait for a better day. And day after day, Robert Scott went in this way, looking at the environment on a great day, 50 miles, on a gray day, 20 miles, and on the tough days, they would stay in the tent. Amundsen. Every morning, they packed up their tents, they put them on the sleds, and they walked for 20 miles. On the days where the sky was blue, they would reach their 20 miles by lunchtime. On the days where the sky were gray, they would take until mid late afternoon to make their 20 miles. And on the days when the wind was gusting in their face, hailstones the size of golf balls were raining down, Amundsen's team would walk until the last hour of light that they would make their 20 miles day after day. Amundsen and his team reached a point 45 miles from the South Pole. And that day when they woke up, the sky was blue, the conditions were perfect. A day that Scott could do 50 miles. And that day, Amundsen and his team started walking. And at 20 miles, Amundsen said to stop. And the team that day begged him, please let us continue. It's within our reach to lose today when it's within our reach. We don't know where Robert Scott is. To lose by one day after all that we've sacrificed, after all that we've been through to get here, to lose by one day would be too painful. Please let us continue. And Amundsen said, no, repair your skis, rest. You've done your 20 miles. Robert Scott is almost more famous than Amundsen. Robert Scott lost the race to the South Pole. Robert Scott and his team passed away on the ice 10 days before reaching a food dump very near to the end of their journey. Roald Amundsen, completed 1,600 miles to the South Pole, and they returned the 1,600 miles back to the shores of Antarctica. And they say that they could have kept going. They could have continued 20 miles day after day. I've been a teacher at the ESA Business School now for 16 years. And one of the things that I try and do when I get the chance is to go in the dining room and sit at the table of the emeritus professors, the professors who've seen 50, 60 years of students arrive to ESA, go through the MBA, the executive MBA, the different programs, and go out into the world. And the question I like to ask the emeritus professors who've seen so many generations of promotions of ESA, I ask them, what can you see in someone who's 27, 28, and someone who's 30, 35, that shows that they're going to make a positive, lasting, significant impact on their company, on their family, on their community? And in every case, the answer is not the most intelligent. The answer is not the one who has the most friends. The answer is not the most charismatic. The answer comes down to this quality of daily habits, 20 miles, the day after day, the things that are truly important, you do not forget. And I have spent most of my time teaching at ESA looking at how do we inculcate these good habits into our lives, that you don't wait for the environment outside to change, you decide what are the habits that you as an individual human being can really benefit from. And over the 16 years that I've been teaching, any one of you, and I'm hoping that there's quite a few faces that I would recognize if I was able to see you now, of the promotions of the executive MBA, the Enfocados, the short focus programs that we've been on, there's a couple of habits that I ask people to practice every day. 
And what I want to ask you now is in this time of quarantine to consider starting some of these habits. One of the habits to, to in order to speak powerfully and speak well, what I share with everyone is practice makes all the difference. Uh, I think there was a, a book many years ago that said that 10,000 hours of practice is what makes all the difference. And today at home, we have our camera. And one of the most powerful ways of really getting good at speaking with impact, at communicating in a way that reaches others, is get your video camera out, get your mobile phone out, set it up, and just capture videos of yourself speaking, talking about what it's like for you, talking about your hopes for the future, talk, talking about what you see in the organization, talking about how your organization has overcome challenges in the past. And use this quarantine to practice your ability to express your messages clearly through video. What I ask everyone who's on my courses is three minutes a day, switch on the record and record yourself speaking. Record it. When it's done, watch it once. Think about how you would improve it, how you make it a little bit better, and then delete it. And the next day, repeat. And if in this time of quarantine, you took the habit of each day just finding a moment, switching on a webcam, switching on your mobile phone camera, selfie mode, and recording a three-minute video about your hopes for the future, about the values that will get us through this, about the type of people that you want to have around you, about the type of team you want to build, about where you see yourself, your organization, your family 10, 20 years from now. If you practice that day after day after day, it'll take a long time to achieve 10,000 hours of practice. 10,000 hours of practice, eight hours a day, that would be five years. Four hours a day, 10 years. Two hours a day, 20 years. But imagine you began that practice today of day after day, working to really get clear in your vision for yourself, working in, in getting good at using the video to convey what's important, where you're going and who you want around you. The second habit that I think has been powerful for me and really helps with your ability to communicate is to write stuff down. And now more than ever is an important time to just practice the habit of noting down when you're feeling fear and, and journaling it out. Back when I was 14 years old, I had the best teacher I've ever had in my life, Mr. Matz. And um, Mr. Matz, uh, he had us, when we were 14 years old, there in, in class in Chicago, the last five minutes of every class, the rule, our pens had to touch our paper in the journal. And I remember day one, I was a young 14-year-old apathetic cynic. I thought, what a stupid exercise. What's the point? Day two, he told us he wasn't even going to read it. I said, what's the point of this? He's not even going to read it. It doesn't count towards our grades. Day three, pointless. Day four, my brother said something interesting to me today. Day five, my mom said something in the car. I've had this habit inculcated by Mr. Matz into me for since I was 14 years old. Uh, I've put down where I am each day, who I'm with, what questions I'm thinking about. All the speeches that I give begin with notes in the journal. Uh, and I would love if each of you in this time where we are in quarantine, when you're feeling scared, when you're feeling fearful, when you're feeling angry, when you're feeling trapped, instead of letting that emotion out, put it into the journal, capture what it feels like to be you in these moments. I often say in my classes that the greatest leadership book for each of us is not one that sits on a shelf behind us. The greatest leadership book that you can have is your own life well documented. Wouldn't it be wonderful if you use this time where we are stuck indoors, where there's no commute, where we have time on our hands, and just start to note down who you are, where you are, where you're going, with whom you want to go. And the, the third habit I've, I've already talked about, Ken Blanchard, starting the day slowly, that when you wake in the morning, become intentional about the day. Write down at the end of the day today, I want to be grateful for. 
and just think about how consciously and intentionally you're going to use this day to move forward. Even if you are trapped within the walls of your own home, even if you can't go out and, and do your work, I'm sure that you and I can find something that we can do to reach out and make this world a slightly better place and contribute to being part of the solution rather than being part of the problem. Now, we're going to go over to questions uh, in a few minutes. I've got all the questions on LinkedIn, YouTube coming through to my iPad just behind the camera. Uh, what I'd love for each of you to do right now is, is something that I call the emotional check-in. And all of our Vistage group meetings, our EO meetings, when I teach a class a couple of times in the morning, the afternoon, I'll just ask everyone one word. How are you feeling right now? And if you had to express how you are right now with one word, what would that one word be? And I'd love for you to just get it clear in your mind. And if you'd like and feel capable, put it in the chat and share it with us. And this idea of becoming emotional aware of the state you're in. And a couple of times each day, just interrupting yourself and labeling the state of mind that you're in. I've learned a lot about myself by, by pausing and interrupting myself and just labeling the state I'm in. And I think a few times in my life, I've escaped doing some truly stupid things in teams or in my family of overreaction because I'm feeling frustrated because I've caught myself, just labeled it and been aware that it's likely that my next action is not going to be positive for the world. So I'm going to go over to uh, our uh, questions here coming in. And we have from Francisco uh, on waking up early, the, the 5 a.m. And, and I know there's a lot of YouTubers out there, a lot of success coaches that talk about waking up at 5 a.m. I can guarantee that I do not wake up at 5 a.m. Uh, I like the night and I really struggle in the morning. Uh, I'm not an early waker. Uh, and in quarantine, it's a real struggle for me to keep uh, and hours that I go to bed at a decent time, I sleep and I wake up with my family, but I am not an early waker. If waking at 5 a.m. is key to success in life, then I'm not going to have that type of success. So Francisco, if you're struggling with getting up early in the morning, I don't think it's the hour that you get up that matters. It's the way you use the hours once you're awake. And it's the way when you start, you consciously become intentional about the way that you want to use the hours that you are awake. I think also on this, I, I don't think of hours that really matter. Uh, I am a great disciple of a, a coach called Dan Sullivan. And Dan Sullivan talks about doing three important things a day, never more. If you try and do more, you'll burn yourself out. But if you really commit that each day you will get really clear what are the three most important things for you to do that day, might be meet with one person, write an article, describe what your ideal team is in five years' time. Pick the three most important things, do that, and when you're finished, rest. Take a rest. Don't just keep being busy. Uh, and that's a hard thing for me. But this, this idea from Dan Sullivan of use the hours to do what's important, not just fill them. And Adnan, do you think that the leadership styles will be shaped after the coronavirus stage? Well, I think, you know, here, coronavirus, any crisis really reveals who we are. Uh, on the television this morning, I was looking at that uh, the chief medical officer in Scotland gave advice to all of Scotland two weeks ago to stay home, don't go out. And then the two weekends, she went to her family's vacation home. And today, finally, after three, four days of outbreak, she had to resign uh, as a leader. And we are leaders at this stage. In a crisis, people pay much more attention. So the, the gap between your lived values and what you're saying is going to be really obvious to people. This is a time where people see what leaders are made of. So this is a time for you with your team where you establish a reputation that is going to take you for the next 20, 30 years. And although it can be very tough right now, remembering that 
what you do now, how you act now will set the tone and your reputation within your company, within your community for years to come. There's few times where people really pay attention to leaders. Most of the time, your organization is paying 2% of attention to you. You're just making noise. Right now, as a leader, you have a real opportunity through your words and your actions to reach people and to show people how they're going to get through this. And sometimes as a leader, when you really feel uncertain, you have to say that. You have to let people know. And, and just even saying there's no new news, but we're still looking at it and we're still thinking about you. I think another of the, the key elements in leadership in a crisis, um, I, I talk often about the, the difference between empathy, sympathy, apathy, and antipathy. And leadership in a crisis, a, if you're leading from a position of sympathy, and sympathy is when someone says they have a problem, you emotionally take that problem as your own. Uh, and it looks really good, but after five, six people have brought you their problems, you're exhausted and you've got no time and no energy for the next person. So sympathy moves you to apathy because after you've taken over five people's problems and all the emotion related to it, you're exhausted and you close the door. If they can still get to you, then you move to antipathy where you deliberately push people away. Empathy. Empathy as a leader is seeing that the greatest thing that can happen to a great person on your team is for them to face big challenges. Because when someone in your team is facing a big challenge, facing a difficult time, as a human being, they're going to grow more now than they will ever grow before. And the leaders that step up and find a path through the current crisis in their businesses, and there are some tough decisions needed to be made in businesses, tough people decisions, tough cash decisions, but those decisions need to be made. And if you have the privilege of a role of leadership, you also have to pay the price of having to take those decisions and put yourself into a state where you're not just reacting, but you're taking those decisions based on the future that you want to be part of building, the values that are important to you and the human beings that are around. So I think now is a real opportunity to establish your reputation for a long period into the future. Personally, what happened in 2008, the bankruptcy that my business through, went through from 2008, 2009, gave me an opportunity to, to act in a certain way that built the relationships that have really been important to me till today. Uh, I think there's a lot of insurance companies that know the only time that they get an opportunity to really show customers what they're made of is when there's a problem, when there's an accident. And a lot of insurance companies are almost waiting for a crisis when you're, you crash your car, when your home is broken into, because then if you as an insurance company show up and show them and take care of them, they'll always remember. So this crisis is a time where you get to show what's really important. But you've got to get your own head right, your own heart right, and find yourself in, in a position where you are able to, to give energy out to other people. Um, Antonio Mata, do companies need a reorganization with the, the change, social distancing, video? I think I've spent more time on Zoom, on Google Hangouts, on Skype, on FaceTime over the last three and a half weeks than in my entire life combined. One of the first things I realized is it's incredibly powerful. There's so much deep conversation that I've had over video over the last three and a half weeks that I never believed was possible. In the medium term, I worry about offices. I think we're seeing that human beings are must, much, much more trustworthy than we let, let on. Uh, people remote in their homes can be trusted to do the work. And, then there's a lot of electronic tools, whether it's Slack and email and the, the team management tools. So we can really stay on top of, of our priorities and what's important without seeing people in the office. Although I, I, I very much miss uh, going into Starbucks, going into a cafe and just seeing other human beings going about their lives. That's something I really miss. I really miss running. I wish I had bought a, uh, an in-home exercise bike three and a half weeks ago. Because uh, exercise and then just seeing other people going about their business. And what I really miss of going up to a ESA business school is, is just watching 
participants going about their business, students in the cafe, other professors going about just saying the social part. So I, I think offices are going to change. We've learned you can trust people a lot more. We've learned that video is very powerful if we allow it to be. Uh, have you considered what makes face-to-face -face unique, uh, different than the video? Absolutely. Uh, and the one big question I have is how to build trusted relationships through this small window that I have to speak to you. Uh, I think transactional stuff we can do through video, but the core part at the beginning of a relationship or when people are going through real challenge uh, or the way I teach in a class, uh, that's a real thing, tough thing to get through here. So I think we're, we're coming to the last few minutes of this. Thank you so much for your questions. I'm going to get on to LinkedIn and YouTube now and respond to them in text. Uh, we're going to finish off here. What I would like to remind you of is that this live stream will be available on YouTube and on LinkedIn in future. Uh, tomorrow at 4 p.m., Mikel Yado, one of the great professors at ESA who's been CEO and lived through a lot, will be running a session, Strategic Thinking for a New World. It will be in Spanish, but Mikel Yado, an excellent opportunity to learn. We'd also encourage you to visit iese.edu, the ESA webpage. Uh, you'll see all of our resources. There's more webinars. And if you sign up for the Friday newspaper, we will keep you informed of future webinars and learning opportunities. It's been a real opportunity, privilege to get half an hour of your lives. Connor and Neil here from my home in Barcelona with my fingers crossed that soon me, you, and three billion other human beings will be allowed to get back out into the world. And I'll never forget the things that I really look forward to doing, going for a walk down the diagonal, going to the park, uh, seeing other people just going about their lives around me. Have a great day. Enjoy this week.